My, is, my name is Dominique and I'm happy to be the session chair today. So the first talk is actually split between uh, two papers. It's a soft, soft merge and the, the both authors will switch in the middle. So in case you have a question, then please make sure you address the question, of course, to the right, uh, to the right author. So the title is Better Than Advertised Security for Non-Intact or Threshold Signatures by Mia Bellare, Elizabeth Wright, Jelisa Komolo, Mary Muller, Stefano Tesaro, and Chen Jui Su. I hope that this was correct. And uh, Elizabeth will, will start with her talk. I'm gonna be talking about the security of non-interactive threshold signatures. This is joint work with Mihir Bellare, Chelsea Komlo, Mary Maller, Stefano Tesaro, and Chen Zizu, who will be my co-speaker. Threshold signatures allow multiple parties to jointly sign a message where some threshold of them is required to sign. This is important for distributing trust because if we have a single key, this represents a single point of failure. But if we distribute the key amongst multiple parties, then we can tolerate some uh, fraction of corrupt signers. This is important because threshold signatures are being used to secure cryptocurrency wallets. Threshold cryptography generally is being standardized through NIST, as well as specific schemes like FROST. In this work, we're gonna focus on non-interactive threshold signatures. So consider an example where two out of three parties are required to sign. If we consider a user called the leader and a fully non-interactive scheme, the leader will send a message to the two signing parties. They will each then form a partial signature, which they send to the leader. The leader then aggregates these partial signatures into a final signature representing the group. Examples of fully non-interactive schemes include threshold BLS and threshold RSA. But what about discrete log-based schemes, and in particular, ones that are pairing free? So currently there exists no fully non-interactive schemes, but there is a scheme called FROST, which consists of two rounds. There's a single signing round preceded by one message independent pre-processing round. We refer to this as partially non-interactive. For ECDSA, there is also a scheme that consists of a single signing round. However, it also incorporates multiple pre-processing rounds which we do not consider in this work. So in this paper, we propose a formal framework for partially non-interactive threshold schemes. We introduce a formal syntax, as well as a hierarchy of security notions. These can be applied to BLS, FROST, and other schemes. But why is this framework needed? Prior to this work, there existed no formalization for partially non-interactive schemes. So we provide the first formal syntax. We also note that existing security notions were actually weaker than what the schemes can achieve. So we propose a fine-grained security hierarchy with stronger notions of security. We also note that the original proof for FROST relied on heuristic assumptions. So in this work, we analyze the security of FROST based on our security hierarchy. We also analyze the security of BLS and note that it achieves a stronger notion of security than was previously realized. This is also implied by the concurrent work of Jens Groff. In this talk, I'm gonna focus on the FROST threshold scheme. And our concrete contributions are as follows. We present FROST2, which is an optimized version of the original FROST scheme that we call FROST1. FROST2 reduces the number of exponentiations required for signing from T to one. We prove the security of both FROST1 and FROST2 under the one more discrete logarithm assumption in the random oracle model. This assumes a trusted DKG. We prove the security of FROST2 
together with the distributed key generation protocol proposed in the original Frost paper. This allows any number of prep signers and in particular a dishonest majority. Our security framework um, introduces a separation in the notions of security achieved by Frost 1 and Frost 2. But as we'll see, both schemes achieve some of the highest notions of security in our framework. So now I'd like to talk about FROST in a little more detail. FROST stands for Flexible Round Optimized Schnorr Threshold Signature. And it was introduced by Conlow and Goldberg in 2020. It consists of a distributed key generation protocol and a concurrently secure two round signing protocol. Also importantly, it outputs a signature which looks exactly like standard single party Schnorr. So this means that it can be used as a drop-in replacement anywhere where Schnorr signatures are used. We also note that there were prior attempts at achieving a two round uh, secure threshold Schnorr scheme, but they were thwarted by the ROS attacks, which we also show are feasible. So Frost was first published in 2020, and since then it's being used to secure cryptocurrency wallets. It is also being standardized through NIST, and there's an IETF draft, which is almost complete. There are also more than five implementations of Frost. Now I'll talk a little bit about the distributed key generation protocol. So we call it PEDPOP and it consists of the Pedersen DKG together with proofs of possession. These proofs of possession are themselves Schnorr signatures. So this requires a knowledge of exponent assumption. This is for simplicity because we did not want to add rounds to the DKG. It allows any number of corrupt signers, including a dishonest majority. Now let's look at the Frost construction, which we'll call Frost 1. We consider uh, that the two out of three signers are participating. In the first round, each signer produces two nonces. So a nonce R and a nonce S. And this is the generator raised to some uniformly random element R and the same for S. Each party produces these two nonces and then sends them to the leader. At this point, the leader chooses the message to be signed and sends that together with the signing set and the set of nonces for those parties. Each signer then computes the following. So they compute a hash, which takes as input the signer index, the message, the public key output by the DKG, as well as the set of all nonces for all parties. The aggregate nonce is computed as a product of each of the R values, the S values raised to this hash value called DJ. Then each party computes the hash of the aggregate public key, the message, and the aggregate nonce. So they then use this to form their partial signature. So a partial signature Z equals R plus this hash value D times S plus the uh, hash value C times the Lagrange coefficient for that signing set times the secret key. They then send their partial signatures to the leader. The leader computes the aggregate uh, value Z by just simply adding the partial signatures together. The final signature consists of the aggregate nonce R and the aggregate value Z. And note that it verifies exactly like standard single party Schnorr. Also note that you can't actually tell who participated in signing, which is great for privacy. So one of the observations that we made in this work was that you don't actually need to have a different hash value per signer. So instead you can actually use the same hash value for all signers. So I've highlighted in red here that the value D no longer takes as input the signer index. Everything else stays the same, verification stays the same. But note that this does reduce the number of exponentiations required for signing from T to one. 
Now we'll talk a little bit about proving the security of FROST2 together with the PEDPOP DKG. So we observed that some of these uh, reductions in the past have had flaws due to the complexity of modeling multiple parties interacting at once and also trying to extract a solution to some hard problem. So in particular, these reductions kind of consist of two moving parts. We have to simulate the honest users with the adversary, and we also have to extract a solution to the hard problem. And our idea was actually to separate these two aspects of the proof. So it looks a bit like this. So we have Frost 2 signing, and which is a multi-party scheme, and we introduce an intermediate assumption called the Bajchnor assumption. You can think of this kind of like a single party assumption. So we first provide a straight line reduction from multi-party Frost 2 to this kind of single party assumption. We then prove security from the Bajchnor assumption to the one more discrete logarithm assumption. So this separates the multi-party aspects from the, re the rewinding required for this part. Then for the PEDPOP distributed key generation, I mentioned that these uh, proofs of possession are Schnorr signatures. So we introduce the Schnorr knowledge of exponent assumption, and we prove it under the discrete logarithm assumption. Note that using PEDPOP, again, uh, allows any number of prep signers, including a dishonest majority. And now I'll hand it over to Chenzi. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, so thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, from uh, from Elizabeth's part, we saw how Frost protocol work. And now I'm going to um, show you a framework and a security hierarchy that can be used to analyze like a fully or partially non directed threshold signatures such as the Frost. Yeah, so before we go into that, let me briefly recall the uh, two motivations. The first, um, there's no formalization for partially non-interactive schemes um, yet. So the original Frost paper, um, they trade the uh, scheme as a general interactive protocols and the simpler abstract abstraction only exists for fully non-interactive schemes. And second, more importantly, um, we find that we, uh, the existing security notions are weaker than a scheme can achieve. So in particular, uh, in a security game defined by most of previous works, uh, M is, so a message M is considered signed as long as one honest party signed it. So th this provides uh, actually a very weak guarantees when, um, uh, when the adversaries does not crop uh, many part uh, signers. However, only a very few uh, prior works consider uh, guarantees stronger than this. Uh, so I will now first introduce the, um, our definition for the in syntax of non-interactive structural signature. Um, so in our setting, there are n signers and a one leader. So for simplicity, let's consider the case where n is equal to three and the threshold t is two. So after DKG, the each signer will um, uh, get um, uh, its shares of the secret key and the leader will get a public key. And during the pre-processing round, each signer will send the uh, tokens to the leader. Um, and then uh, the leader start to create a leader request, which contains a message M to be signed uh, and a set of signer uh, that are involved. So, uh, which denote as SS, um, which um, required to have size at least T. So over here, um, for example, it can be just one and three. And this leader request also contains some auxiliary information uh, that can depend on pre-processing token. And for example, for Frost, um, the auxiliary information adjusts all the pre-processing tokens, uh, which are the nouns uh, for the designated signers. And then either send a request to all the designated signers, and then each signer replies with a partial signature. And finally, the leader combines those signature, partial signatures to get a valid signature for the message end. So the security, in terms of security, we want to get uh, the schemes to have to guarantee the unforgeability. Um, 
So in the, so in the, uh, so in the setting, we consider the leader as the adversary. And so, sorry, yeah. And they can corrupt um, uh, at most T minus one signers. And uh, we're corrupting means uh, just, so the adversary will learn the secret key of those sign, uh, the corrupted signers. And then the adversary will, uh, can interact with other honest signers. And the goal is to output a, a, a signature for the message M star. And here the unforgeability tries to guarantee that the adversary cannot forge any non-trivial signature. So here the question is, uh, what is a trivial um, signature? So it's the same as to ask, it's the same to ask um, what signatures are considered to be issued during the interaction. And it turns out that uh, this was the major problem we are dealing with in this work. We find it's not uh, easy to define uh, um, uh, the uh, define it for the threshold signature. And also there's no canonical way to do it. So before we go into that, uh, I will introduce uh, our general framework for modeling the security. So in, in this work, we use a game-based definition. So we use the CS to know the set of corrupt designers and the interaction between the so between the adversary and the honest signers are modeled by um, uh, two oracles, there's PP oracle and a P sign oracle. So for the, so when an adversary queries an index I to the PP oracle, uh, it, send, it returns uh, tokens for the signer I. And when it uh, queries the P sign oracle for index I and the L rec, uh, it will answer the L rec um, uh, on, the behave, on behalf of the signer I. And here the I have, uh, must be a honest signer and the adversary can make arbitrary numbers of query to them. And here there are three wins if the final output message and signature pair is not a trivial forgery. Okay, so let's come back to the problem of what is a trivial forgery. Uh, so here it turns out there, so the rough picture as follows. There is a, a several ways we can define it. And a different way leads to a different security levels. And moreover, uh, the more strictly the security level, uh, the more strictly the trivial forgery condition will lead to a, a stronger um, security level, and which will give us a security hierarchy. So, uh, so the starting example is I was going to talk about the simplest and the weakest one in our hierarchy. Which is a TSUF zero. So here we uh, let the L denote the set of uh, all adversaries queries to the P sign oracle. And uh, so for TSUF zero, um, forgery is considered to be trivial if there exists a query to um, an L such uh, for the M for the message M star. So more visibly, so if the adversary, as long as it makes a query to the PSIGN Oracle for the M star, then um, its forgery is considered to be trivial. So in other words, uh, this TSU of zero guarantees that as long as the adversary, um, um, so the adversary can forge the signatures uh, as, uh, if, uh, only if there's at least one only signer that signs M star. And this is a notion considered uh, by most of the previous work. And so when the property set is less than T minus one, firstly that there are stronger security considerations. So to give you more intuitions, so consider an adversary uh, that does not corrupt any signer and it make a single query to P sign Oracle for M star and then it outputs um, a signature for M star. So, you can see that this does not root out by TSUF zero security. But however, if you're thinking about it, we're in a, a threshold setting, we have a threshold T. So it's reasonable to require that at least T signers to, uh, to, to answer, uh, to get a partial signature into, for it to get a signature. 
So this leads us to define our next uh, security level. So um, to define it, uh, we first introduce a very convenient notion called MSS. For, uh, so intuitively, this um, so MSS for a message M represents a set of only signers that signs M. So with this notion, we can define the TSUF zero simply as um, so. So the trivial forgery condition is the size of M S for M star is greater than zero, and so to extend to TSUF one security, um, um, uh, the the trivial forgery condition is transcend as the size of M S as for M star is at least t minus the size of corrupted party. And this is a notion. Uh, so this security is considered by a few prior works. And so then the next question is, uh, do we go even stronger? So um, to answer this, we have to thinking about like what is missing in this TSUF1. And it's turned out that the over three, um, it's actually possible in this TSUF1 setting to um, to combine different partial signatures for message M star, but from different L rack. And it's natural that uh, to get we uh, to root out this. Um, so this uh, so this leads to define securities beyond the TSUF1. Um, so I will first introduce an, another mean a notion called RSS. So it was similar to MSS, but it's defined for each individual um, leader request instead of the message. So intuitively, this means the set of only signer that answered LRAC. And now, um, so the next security level defined is called TSUF2, and it's defined as the, so a message signature pair is considered trivial, if and only if the existing leader request such that uh, leader request for message M and it was answered by a number of honest signers that is least uh, T minus the size of corrupt parties. And intuitively, this, oh, uh, this were like root out the possibility to combine different uh, partial signatures from different LRAC. And from this, we can go all the way to the top of our security hierarchy, um, which we call TSUF4, where the difference from TSUF2 is that now the RSS for LRAC is required to be all the only signers that is supposed to be queried. So in other words, so this security guarantees that, as um, so it was three uh, can, um, when he uh, makes query to LRAC, they have to um, send queries to all the uh, all the only signers that is supposed to be sent in order to get a signature. And so how is to consider? And we also consider uh, about like stronger forgeability in this work. So for, which is analogous to the stronger forgeability for a signature scheme. So for signature schemes, the strong forgeability is defined as um, um, so the uh, so when you adversary get the signature from a signer, um, even if you get a signature for message M, it is not possible for you to forge a different signature for M. However, find it's not easy to uh, define it for threshold signature because now we have a partial signature instead of a uh, a real signature sent by signer. So it was unclear which signature is actually being issued. Therefore, um, we have to, uh, so we are restrict ourselves to a special class of uh, schemes which has deterministic signing, which means that for each public key and a leader request, there is a unique message and signature pair that is supposed to be uh, issued if all the parties uh, follow the protocol. And we denote this map by phi. 
notice here that this M must be equal to the leader, uh, the message container leader request. And also note that it does not mean that the signature have to be deterministic, um, uh, have to be unique to each message. Things like uh, this signature can be differed given a different LREC. And the um, example for schemes such as schemes include FROST 1 and 2. And with the help of this five function, we can define a stronger plausibility version of the FROST the TSUF2 and TSUF4, where the difference are the highlighted part. Um, and so, uh, in, so in short, like, so the, so it changed the, so it, so when you're tracking the, so the difference is that when you're tracking the uh, trivial forgery condition, you only track, you only track the leader request uh, such that it was direct, uh, exactly corresponding to the output forgery. And now here's the full picture of uh, our, uh, our security hierarchy. Um, so the arrow from the A to B represents the security A implies B. So I will now briefly mention the, the result we're getting based on this hierarchy. So first we show a loose reduction from a TSUF zero to TSUF one with a factor of uh, N choose T, sorry, yeah. And uh, for BLS, we show um, that it is TSUF one secure, but not TSUF two. And this is showed, uh, so the security is proved under the uh, TVCDH assumption, which is a new assumption we propose in the random oracle model. And for us one, for us one, we show that uh, it is TSUF3 secure, but not T TSUF4 secure. And for us two, we showed is TSUF2 secure, but not TSUF3 secure. Um, so from this, you can see a separation from the security of us one and two. And we prove their security under the one more log assumption in the random oracle model. So note here that all previous work for LS and Frostic only consider TSUF zero security. And finally, we also show a general transformation from TS uh, from the third level of security to the fourth level of security. Uh, so uh, finally, I would like to give you a uh, some uh, brief intuition about the separation between the frost one and two. So let's consider the following adversary for frost two. So in the setting, there is um, uh, four signers and the threshold is three. So then the adversary first crop the party three and four, sorry, the sign is three and four, and it makes two queries to the P, uh, PP Oracle and getting the tokens for sign of one and token for sign of two. And then you create a leader request with a, a message M star and the designated signer is one, two, and three. And then it sets the, for the token part, it sets the token for um, party one and two honestly, but uh, he sent, uh, set a token for party three in a malicious way such that it can, it only need to make one query to the sign of one to get a valid signature. So why this is interesting? Well, we find that this uh, attack is not possible for frost one. So for frost one, it was we have to query both sign of one and sign of two. And in general, it's um, required that uh, it to make queries to all the honest signers that with these tokens are honestly set. So this uh, subtle um, security consideration actually lead us to define the TSUF3 secure, which is satisfied by FROST1, but not FROST2. And to conclude, uh, here's um, uh, a few highlights of uh, the main uh, contribution of this work. And for future work, it's interesting to know that what's the other applications for each of a security level. And other interesting questions include like how to add adaptive security, or also consider the UC models, and also uh, they're possible to also capture the general DKG protocol in this framework. So that's, yeah, that's all for the talk. Thank you. Thank you for this.
don't know. So. Hello? Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I wanted to ask with respect to uh, the future work, adaptive security, do you have an intuition on whether you may be able to do it with the current number of rounds or whether you might have to increase the number of rounds to have an adaptively secure protocol? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, we're, we, we're not like, yeah, we're not like doing, yeah, have many results on the adaptive now. Uh, and I, uh, I think, yeah, it was hard to prove the, like frauds have the adaptive security for now because of like um, in the standard, like I'm proving the standard model and you need um, the windings and then you're, and you cannot, yeah, so the, there are some technical difficulties there. Yeah. Thanks for the nice talk. So I have a question about the first two. So if I understand correctly, your optimization relates to um, random coefficient for um, aggregating the random noises. Um, in that case, like, is it okay to derive the random coefficient by hashing the product of R's and S, or do you need to um, hash all these separately? That's a good question. Um, so because we introduced this intermediate assumption, the Baishnor assumption, um, you actually need to have all of the nonces be separate. I should note though, that this isn't necessarily the case if you consider the multi-sig version of this, then you can actually do the combination. Okay. Thank you, that's your interesting, thank you. Yeah, um, uh, thank you very much for the talk. I uh, I just wanted to ask, it looked like from some of the, like between your security levels, the separation was like, oh, in this one, it's enough to get um, like, answers for this please sign this message query for this lrec but then for other ones you needed them all to answer like the same specific lrec so the adversary couldn't append for like the servers that he knows like the partial key couldn't append um his signatures to the signatures he got from the honest player i didn't understand the significance of this since the adversary can like send any lrec so he can send the same lrec to himself and then hand sign also, I, I think I missed level three. I only saw levels one, two, and four. Yeah, um, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, we, yeah, I accept the, uh, the, the level three, yeah, because it's more technical. And for the, yeah, for the question of, yeah, so the signing you mean like, the adversary can choose the LRAC itself. So I guess like, you can, so you can choose the LRAC, so like in, include all the property party it has. Is that what you're right? Practicing? So he can he can send the same L rec to himself that he just sent to them to the honest players and got the answer for, and then he can append. So I didn't see like the separation in the yeah, I see. So so um it prevents some attack like so the adversary they don't actually do this, so they they send different L rec to different party um for some reason. So and then like we want to like show that it's not possible, like you just you just send like like different LRAC to just each one of them. And then like each one, it, it just feel they just received one, but they're not, um, yeah, so. So it basically prevents, there's some, there's some basically, it prevents adversary from like um, being favorable with respect to its LRACs. Like there's some attack that it prevents. And we can take this later. So yeah. Just, okay. So thank you guys very much uh, for the talk. Thanks. So let's uh, thank the speakers again. The next and the last talk in this session is Threshold Signatures with Private Accountability by Chelsea Komolo and Dan Bonnet, and Chelsea will give the talk once the slides are there.
podcast. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, we're good to go. Okay, uh, hi everyone, I'm Chelsea Comlo, and uh, I'm here to present joint work with Dan Bonet. Uh, and this work is on private signatures or threshold signatures with private accountability. Uh, and our ePrint is coming soon. So <laughs> uh, watch out for that. So we just looked at threshold signatures in the past talk. Um, so uh, I'll just recap them briefly, uh, just in case you forgot. So uh, what a threshold signature scheme is, is it's a public private scheme uh, where you have some secret key that's partitioned among a set of parties. Um, and so here we look at a two out of three scheme, there's three total parties. Um, and then the threshold in the scheme is, is two. And um, here the public key uh, represents the entire group. So here we have one single public key and then uh, private keys shared amongst all these parties. And to sign, um, you basically you have a message coming in and then each of the signers sends a signature share to the combiner. And so what's important here is that um, out of the three total parties, um, two of these parties are required to send signature shares. And then the combiner outputs a signature that represents the group. And what's nice about these types of schemes is that um, when participants perform signing, they're not actually sending secret key material uh, over the wire to each other. And so um, what's nice is that secret key material stays local and they can really use like generally like public but authenticated channels in order to send uh, or to communicate with each other when performing this protocol. So looking at the literature, um, there, what this is uh, something that we formalize in our work, but there's actually two types of what are actually mutually exclusive threshold schemes uh, in the literature today. So the first type of threshold scheme in the literature is what we call a private threshold scheme or a PTS. And we'll look at next what privacy actually means, but just keep in your mind, this is sort of one category of threshold scheme. And then the second category is um, an accountable threshold scheme. And we refer to this as an ATS. And in the literature, you can also think about these as um, accountable subgroup multi-signatures. So that's sort of the name that's been given to them in the literature, but we call these ATSs really for symmetry. So what do you, you might say like, okay, PTS versus ATS, how do these actually differ? So with a PTS, um, there's, or with each of these schemes, there's two types of information that we care about. The first type of information is the signer quorum, and the second type of information is the threshold. So uh, really the way that these schemes differ is what information is exposed to who. So for a PTS, um, the signing quorum uh, is not learned either by the public, so someone who isn't allowed to participate in the signing scheme, or signers. So looking at a signature af after it's been published, you can't see who participated in that signing operation. Uh, and then for the threshold, looking at a signature after it's been published, the public also doesn't learn the threshold. But if you're a signer, you trivially learn the threshold just by participating in the signing protocol. For an ATS, uh, all, this information is learned by everyone. So once a signature has been published, you're able to kind of learn everything, um, whether or not you're allowed to be a signer or not. And so really uh, what we do in this work, the, our major contribution is we introduce what we call a TAPS. And this is a new type of threshold signature. So I want to emphasize that um, this is kind of a new primitive to the threshold signature scheme literature. And you might say, okay, what is a TAPS? Well, <laughs> uh, it's really like combining these two notions. So we talked about privacy and accountability. And what a TAPS does is it allows for both of these notions to be achieved. So like a PTS um, for a TAPS, the public does not learn the signing quorum or the threshold. So to the public, uh, a TAPS looks exactly like a PTS. But like an ATS, uh, the signing quorum can be recovered by a designated entity. So essentially the differentiator here is that if you're a designated entity, uh, you can participate in what is essentially an ATS. But if you're not, everything else looks like a PTS. And you might say like, okay, this looks like magical cryptography. Why do we care about this? And this is actually very useful if you're say a financial institution and you share secret signing material with your clients. 
um, your client might come and say like, hey, you participated in sending all my funds away and like I didn't get to participate in that. So please give me my money back. Uh, you, with the TAPS, you're actually able to prove or disprove that you participated in issuing these signatures without revealing uh, more information publicly. And something that I think is really interesting about a TAPS is that um, we're actually able to achieve a notion of post-compromise accountability that hasn't been able to be achieved in the literature before. So in threshold schemes in the past, really the threat model has considered the adversary being able to compromise up to a threshold number of signers. And after that, you generally just sort of consider threshold schemes to be broken. So after an adversary controls this many number of parties, uh, all security properties are lost. And so here, like we can't prevent unforgeability if more than a threshold number of parties has been corrupted, but we can provide a notion of post-compromise accountability. So even though maybe some bad behaviors happened and adversary controls more than a threshold, you can at least go and identify later uh, what has happened. And so I think that's kind of um, a key distinction of a TAPS that makes it useful in practice. So driving home how a TAPS uh, relates to a threshold signature, again, we have our two out of three parties, a message comes in, your signers send the signature shares to the combiner and the combiner outputs a signature. But um, here, this in the TAPS, the combiner also provides a proof that T signers signed. And we'll look at how this proof is actually produced later. Uh, then um, the signature can be input into this tracer, which is our designated entity. And the tracer is then able to output which parties participated. Um, but again, this tracer is our designated entity, and so no one else is able to produce this information. So this is sort of writ large um, how a TAPS augments a threshold signature scheme. And if you're familiar with um, sort of multi-party signatures in the literature, you can think of a TAPS as a generalization of a group signature. So a group signature really allows for this, these same properties, but only with one signer. And so what a TAPS does is it's, it takes that and it allows for more than one signer. So a little bit more formally, when we think about a TAPS, uh, we think about uh, these five algorithms. So a key gen, sign, combine, verify, and trace algorithms. And we say that a TAPS must be secure. So it has to be unforgeable. It has to be private and accountable. So let's look at what that means next. I guess looking a little bit more closely at these algorithms. Uh, so again, like a threshold signature, uh, key gen will output the public key. It will output secret keys for each of the participants. But then a little bit differently, it outputs secret keys for both the combiner and for the tracer. So uh, these secret keys for a combiner and tracer is what is different from um, a lot of threshold schemes you might have seen before. And uh, while I show this here in a centralized manner, this could also be performed in a distributed manner as well. Sign looks exactly like you'd expect in a threshold scheme. So it takes a message, the secret key for the participant and a coalition of signers, and it outputs a partial signature uh, for that participant. Uh, combine takes the secret key for the combiner, the message, the coalition of signers, and um, the signature shares, and it outputs the TAP signature. So it really takes all of the partial signatures and outputs the TAP signature for the public. Verify is exactly as you'd expect for a threshold signature. So it takes the signature, public key message, and outputs a bit indicating if it's valid or not. And then trace uh, takes a secret key for the tracer. So this is what um, makes the tracer a designated entity, the message, and the tap signature. And it either outputs uh, the coalition of signers or failure. Um, so this is sort of what takes this tap signature and it says who participated in signing. Right, so now we're gonna look at um, the security properties for a TAPS. So I said that a TAPS has to be unforgeable, private and accountable. So let's look at unforgeability and accountability next. So for unforgeability, what we mean by this is that an adversary cannot output a valid signature uh, without controlling, or if they control fewer than a threshold number of parties. So this is the same unforgeability notion that we um, learned about in the prior talk. 
And so this is basically the same sort of base notion of unforgeability you'd consider for a threshold signature. For accountability, what's interesting here is we actually don't put um, a restriction on the number of parties that the adversary is able to control. Um, so for accountability, all we say is that the adversary can't output a valid signature that traces to an honest non-signer. So the adversary here can control more than a threshold number of parties. This is what gets us that kind of uh, post-compromise uh, accountability. But we say that even if they are in that setting, uh, they can't frame someone as having signed that didn't actually sign. So a little bit more formally uh, for our enforceability and accountability games, uh, so we have our adversary and our environment. And the adversary begins by choosing the number of total parties, the threshold, and uh, the number of parties that it wants to corrupt. And in return, it re receives the public key and the secret keys for all of the parties that it chooses to corrupt. It's able to query for partial signatures of any parties that it chooses. So it can say, I want a partial signature for any of these end parties. And at the end, it's required to output um, some valid TAPS signature with respect to a message. And what's interesting is here, um, we're actually encoding both the unforgeability and the accountability games. So there's two win conditions that can occur. So um, an adversary wins if it meets either of these conditions. So the first condition is if the adversary produces a valid signature and it controls fewer than the threshold number of parties. So this is our unforgeability setting, or it outputs a valid signature that traces to an honest non-signer. This is the accountability setting. So really what changes here is um, the, the set C that the adversary designates. And we say that a TAPS is unforgeable, unforgeable and accountable if the probability that it wins is negligible. So I think that's kind of uh, what's neat in, in this game is that really the key difference is the number of parties that the adversary controls. So for privacy, we actually um, sort of split privacy into two different notions. So first, uh, we refer to privacy against the public, and this is for any entity that um, isn't a valid signer. So again, as we talked about before, uh, a TAP signature is considered private against the public if they're not able to learn either the threshold or the quorum of signers. And then we then sort of go a bit more strongly and we say that there's this notion of privacy against signers. So these are entities that are allowed to um, hold uh, secret key shares. And we say, even if you're allowed to participate in signing, looking at the top signature, it shouldn't reveal anything about uh, who participated in signing. So again, looking at these games, um, for the privacy against the public game, the adversary here is again able to choose the total number of parties, but here it chooses two different thresholds, so T0 and T1. Um, and then key gen is performed with respect to some challenge. Uh, one of these two thresholds uh, chosen at random. So this bit B is chosen at random, and then uh, key gen is performed with respect to TB. The adversary receives the public key, and then it's able to query, uh, sorry, I'll go through this a little bit more. So it's able to query um, four tap signatures, that's the output of the combined algorithm. Um, but again, it provides two different coalitions. So C0 uh, is a coalition that uh, is with respect to T0, and C1 is with respect to T1. And it receives a tap signature that is with respect to CB. So it's with respect to either one of these uh, coalitions, which one the adversary does not actually know. And then it's also allowed to query the tracing oracle. Um, at the end, outputs uh, a bit B, which is its guess. And so we do put a restriction on this game where the adversary can't query the tracing oracle for anything that it received uh, from the combined oracle. And that's just to prevent uh, a trivial win. And yeah, so basically uh, this is a distinguishing game. So the adversary wins if it's able to guess B correctly. Um, and if it, if it guesses B correctly, then it, it's able, and reliably it's able to gain some information about the threshold. And we say that uh, TAPS is private against the public if uh, the probability that it wins is negligible. So then um, we, encode uh, the notion of privacy against signers. 
So here, um, the adversary again chooses N and T. Um, it doesn't choose a challenge. And what's interesting about this game is it actually receives all of the N signing keys. So this actually probably looks quite different from a lot of the threshold um, security games you've seen in the past. So it actually receives all of this information. Uh, again, it's able to query for um, a tap signature with respect again to either of these two coalitions. And again, it's able to query the tracing oracle and it uh, outputs a guess uh, B prime at the end. And we have the same restriction where it can't query the tracing oracle with outputs from combined, again, to prevent the trivial win case. And um, we say that adversary wins if it's able to reliably guess B prime, which means that it can infer some kind of information about the quorum of signers. And so we say taps is private if the probability that it wins is negligible. So I think what's, what's interesting in these two games is um, they're distinguishing games and the public game, the adversary is able to guess the threshold or it's able to provide the threshold and it must distinguish which one is used. Here, um, it's able to provide the coalition, the coalitions and it must guess, guess which coalition is used, but it also is given the secret keys for all of the signers. Um, and that's, that looks a little bit different than probably things you've seen in the threshold literature in the past. Okay, so um, those are our security notions. We then provide a generic TAPS construction. So what the generic TAPS construction does is it um, essentially uh, encrypts an ATS signature, and then it proves in generic zero knowledge that this encrypted ATS signature is valid. So um, again, sort of referring what ATS is, is it's an accountable threshold scheme. So just by looking at a plain ATS signature, you should be able to see who signed. But here for the generic construction, what we do is we encrypt it and then we prove in generic zero knowledge that this uh, signature is valid. And this um, encrypted ATS signature is encrypted to the tracer. So because the tracer has a secret key, it's able to decrypt and therefore recover uh, the set of signers. Uh, and then um, the threshold is, we don't reveal the threshold in the clear. The threshold is um, provided in the public key simply as a commitment. And so again, this generic zero knowledge proof is able to prove that this ATS is valid. It has um, the proper set of signers with respect to the public key where the threshold is committed to. So um, driving into this a little bit more, so what a generic TAPS signature looks like is, again, it has this public key encryption of the ATS signature. It has a zero knowledge proof that the ATS signature is valid. Um, and then we also require that the combiner um, authenticates this TAP signature. And that's because we allow the adversary to have access to this tracing oracle in all of these games. So in order to um, prevent uh, different kinds of attacks, we require that the combiner does authenticate this TAP signature. So then um, after we designed this generic scheme, what we wanted to do is we wanted to provide a Schnorr construction. So um, in looking at this though, we actually came up against some challenges. So the generic scheme requires proving that the signature is valid in generic zero knowledge. But Schnorr requires proving that the output from a hash function is derived correctly. So in Schnorr, um, as we'll look at in the next slide, uh, the verifier derives um, the challenge, which is itself a hash of the commitment and the message. And this is expensive to do in generic zero knowledge. So in looking at this, we actually had the goal of finding a simpler, more efficient solution. Uh, and happily we were able to do so. So first I'm going to uh, re-explain a little bit about the structure of Schnorr signatures. So um, if you recall Schnorr signatures, uh, they're a tuple of two elements. The first element is a commitment to a nonce. So this R value is a commitment to randomness that's used during the signing protocol. And then the second element is the response. So this is the, the proof that um, the signer signed using their secret key with respect to a message um, where there's randomness that was committed to in R. And then in Schnorr, like I said before, the verifier derives the challenge, which is the hash of uh, the commitment and the message. And then they check um, that the response is valid with respect to the public key, the challenge, and this commitment. 
So um, we actually had this insight, which is very simple, but actually quite powerful and allows um, everything else to sort of follow quite simply. And so our insight is that publishing uh, this commitment in the clear doesn't actually hurt privacy. So only publishing the response or only the response must be protected. Um, so once we had this insight, we're like, oh, we can actually publish R, we can deviate from the generic construction. Uh, creating this Schnorr taps became much simpler. So uh, our Schnorr taps it deviates a little bit from our generic construction where we additionally publish this commitment. And what that allows for is improved efficiency and simplicity over the generic construction. And so the verifier derives uh, the challenge directly. So um, I'm going to show you the zero knowledge relation now very quickly. You don't need to understand all of this math, but uh, the reason why I'm showing you is because um, it sort of drives home the fact that in our Schnorr construction, we're able to get something which is actually quite simple for the zero knowledge relation. So um, the statement in our Schnorr taps, um, we have the generators, we have a commitment uh, to the threshold T, which is just LGML. We have the Schnorr commitment, the Schnorr challenge, the encrypted ATS or the encrypted ATS signature. And then for the witness, we simply have randomizers along with um, uh, the ATS response and bits indicating which signer signed. So then our relation is very simple. So first it proves that the response is valid for a subset of public keys. So what it does is um, this response is in the witness so it says for some uh, subset of public keys, at least T of them, uh, this response must be valid. It then proves um, that the ciphertext of this ATS is valid and it's a valid encryption to the tracer's public key. It then proves that the signing form contains T signers. And then uh, for completeness, it proves that each of the bits are zero or one. So really what these last two lines are is it's proving that at least T signer signed without revealing what T actually is. So this is how we're able to achieve proving that uh, this ATS signature uh, is valid without actually revealing what the signature is or what the threshold is. So this is sort of all the magic in a nutshell. Um, and the performance of our uh, Schnorr taps is actually quite good. Um, it does grow linearly with respect to the number of signers. So in the public key for both um, constructions that we give, um, but considering uh, most instantiations of threshold schemes, you know, we were looking at two out of three examples. So if the total number of signers is three, this is actually quite reasonable. Um, and then, However, when the total number of signers is large, uh, we do provide a bulletproofs uh, instantiation. So essentially uh, the difference is we provide a sigma construction where it's reasonable if the total number of signers is small. If the total number of signers is large, you can use bulletproofs. And um, that means that the signature size uh, is, remains quite reasonable. So overall, what do we do in this work? Um, we uh, introduce a new type of threshold signature scheme and we refer to this threshold signature scheme as a TAPS. And what a TAPS does is it, um, it ensures both privacy and accountability of the signature. We define a generic construction uh, that employs an encrypted ATS. And then we define a Schnorr construction that actually leverages the structure of Schnorr sh signatures to simplify the zero knowledge relation. So we do provide a generic construction, but then we're able to do better in our uh, Schnorr instantiation. And then we define both sigma and bulletproofs instantiations of the zero knowledge argument for our Schnorr instantiation. And that's all. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? <laughs> Yes, I had a secret key. It did not have the secret key. Um, so yeah, so I should have gone over this a little bit more in detail. So keygen outputs secret keys for all of the signers. 
it outputs a secret key for the combiner and a secret key for the tracer. So that secret key for the combiner just allows it to authenticate um, the tap signatures that are output. So it's not the same secret key as what all of the signers hold. So yeah, so it can't forge signatures. It can't really do anything that signers can do. It's just to allow authentication of the taps. So um, it, it depends a little bit. So for uh, actually quite a lot of, um, at least some of the use cases I know of, uh, signers are distributed, but um, the proof, for example, if you're producing um, uh, a more involved proof, the prover is actually one entity. So this is, uh, for example, in the Zcash setting, uh, the signers are distributed, but the prover that actually produces the snark demonstrating that you know all these you know relations that the merkle trees pass the merkle trees valid um that's a single entity so this kind of use case actually fits very well in that setting um if you wanted to distribute the role of the combiner you could also do that but really here the combiners uh trusted to aggregate signatures and not disclose the privacy of the signers and and that's it so Oh, hi, I'm Matt. Thanks for the talk. May mm -hmm. I ask a question about the compatibility definitions? Does it prevent the reverse way to do the signature that's uh, uh, traced to a strictly subset, strict subset of the signer so that some malicious party can sign without being traced later? Because I saw the, the definition only says that uh, it prevents someone, the non sign, like prevent some, someone that doesn't sign this being traced, but it doesn't prevent some. Right. Yeah, um, so let me just restate the question to make sure I understand. So, uh, accountability means that, uh, a dishonest party cannot frame someone who did not participate in signing. Yeah, but uh, it doesn't prevent the, someone that do sign, but like being on trace later, right? It's possible that someone signed, but uh, he can, he can prevent being traced. Um, that should, yeah. So if you look at our, our definition, it, it prevents against that case. I just didn't uh, talk about it very closely, but yeah. So accountability means that you can't lie about who participated in signing. So you can't frame a signer, but you also can't exclude yourself. So um, if you look at our, our definition. So basically the tracing must be like exactly trace the exact set of signing, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, it considers that, but yeah, we can talk more. Um, so I was just trying to figure out when you're talking about privacy from the signers, mm -hmm. it seems like unless you're doing some extra blinding sort of thing, um, the signers who participated know that they were in on the, on the forum. They just don't know who the other members of the forum is. Is that the idea? So, right. So this, so privacy against signers is, it's a bit ambiguous. So here you're, you're correct that if you participated in signing, you'll know that you participated in signing. Um, that's sort of a different notion. We didn't right. know how to give that notion a name, so we don't actually consider it. And it also seems hard to achieve that without extra notions like private channels and um, anonymity and like additional things. Yeah. Um, so yes, this doesn't prevent um, if you're a signer knowing that you participated in signing. Of but, a particular but, signature. But you can't so. know who else participated in signing, right? So if, if if Alice and Bob both participated in signing in a two of three scheme, Alice knows she signed, but she doesn't know whether it was Bob or Peril who helped, right? Um, that's a little bit outside of what so here we don't consider that because um, for example, in sign it takes the form of signers in our algorithm. Mm -hmm. So it would be a, it would be a different scheme to not know what other signers signed. Okay, so I guess what so. I'm trying to understand is what's what do what do you guarantee from the signer privacy then? Because I don't I I yeah. just realized I don't understand what the what the definition is from the signature. Looking at the signature, you can't extrapolate who signed. Okay, so I can yeah. still remember what happened, my own participation. I yes. just can't look at a signature and say, oh, now looking at that, I know who. Correct. 
Okay. Yeah. So this actually, it depends. We have a note on this. Um, so which signature scheme, like this whole remembering thing, um, you it will influence um, this uh, signer privacy notion. So like for Schnorr, for example, if I participate in a Schnorr signature, I can look at the commit commitment later and say like, oh, I participated in that. Um, you can have the combiner do some kind of blinding step, and we note that as future work. Um, but yeah, by this notion, we just mean looking strictly at the signature, can you extrapolate information from that? All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, hey, thanks for the talk. Hopefully yeah. brief question so everybody can go. Uh, just follow up on that question uh, because the key gen also generates like a secret key for the combiner. Yes. So like this this scheme doesn't support the generic thing that like, you know, there's, there's this big group of N potential signers mm -hmm. and then people would, pa different people would pass them messages which they can examine and decide if they want to sign and then combine right it's only that one combiner can query those like n servers for their signature shares right Am uh, I, um... let me re rephrase the question to make yeah. sure i understand uh so you're asking like does this model assume like anyone but the combiner can query signers yeah um so in our in our notions, we assume that adversary can query. So like in the unforgeability game, the adversary is querying for signature shares. Um, so I think we do consider that notion of unforgeability and accountability. Um, but I'm happy to talk more. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So there are questions from, uh, from the internet. So the first one is the following. Group signature tracing openings normally output a publicly checkable proof that the tracing was correctly done. Do you have something similar to this for tabs? Do you consider the tracer to always be honest? Um, here, right. So here the, the tracing algorithm does output either just the coalition. Uh, there's no reason why it couldn't also output the um, unencrypted ATS or depending on whatever model. So I think that it can be extended to that setting. We did not do that, but there's no reason why it couldn't be. Okay, and the second question, am I right that you couldn't do the ZK proof alongside the plain Schnorr SIG to have accountability on top of a plain Schnorr SIG because you need to hide the S? Um, so let me rephrase. So the question is asking that the zero knowledge proof is to ensure accountability for the encrypted uh, Schnorr signature. Is, is that the question or? Um, it seems to me the question is towards why you didn't do it exactly on top of version uh, or maybe the person online can rephrase it quickly. Okay, so the reason why we didn't do it on top of plain Schnorr is because it's a uh, Schnorr ATS. So looking at the plain Schnorr ATS, you can tell who signed. So we have to encrypt the Schnorr ATS in order to hide, in order to achieve privacy. And then in order to prove that the signature is valid, we have the zero knowledge proof. Did this answer the question online, hopefully? Yeah, yeah he got it. Okay, okay great. <laughs> Good. Thank you, so people uh, from the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, thank Chelsea again. And okay, also... thank you very much. <laughs>